Good afternoon, and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens, Let's Talk Gardens. My name is Cindy Brown. I'm the Education and Collections Manager here at Smithsonian Gardens. And during this presentation, we ask that you put your questions in the chat box, please. And then when our guest is finished finish speaking, we'll go ahead and we'll ask some of the questions to, to our, our presenter. I'm saving her name as a surprise, not that you can't see her, but <laughs> uh, we'll ask her some questions and uh, uh, proceed with some con conversation. I know she's got a lot to share, so don't be surprised if we don't get very many questions in it. And I'm really excited to introduce you to Janet Draper. Janet really shouldn't need any introduction, uh, but just so you know, Janet is a fabulous plants woman. Uh, she's been on our show several times uh, as a guest and she is a Smithsonian Gardens horticulturist, which makes it even better because you can see her work in our gardens, which is greatly appreciated by all. Janet, what do you have in store for us today? We're going to take a look back of, at how the perennial industry has changed during my lifetime. So lots that of changes. That can't be a lot because you're just not that old. So. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's yeah. great. Well, I'm going to disappear, Janet. But if you have any problems, let me know. I'm here. You're covered with Zach and me. You'll be fine. So awesome. just raise your hand and say help. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, Cindy. Thank you. All right. Hey, everyone. For those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm Janet. I get to play in the dirt for a living. I mean, how fortunate am I? This is my normal workwear covered in dirt. I mean, that is that is my happy place. And where I garden is the Mary Livingston Ripley Garden. For those of you who don't know it, it's a little spit of land between the Arts and Industries Building and the Hirshhorn Museum, right on the National Mall. And like I say, it's just a tiny space. It's only a third of an acre, and it's basically a cut through from Jefferson Drive on the Mall to Independence Avenue. And it's got raised planters in the front. Oops go back one and meandering this meandering pathway that leads back to uh, independence. Uh, I am the sole paid gardener in the garden. And because neither the arts and industries building nor the Hirshhorn claims this as their garden, I have no theme. So I get to decide what goes in and show you all kinds of things. It's whatever I can get my fingers on and, and just trying to show you different ways to garden or different plants to use, like using vegetables with your, your spring bulbs. Right now, the vegetables are looking awesome. That's a red giant mustard on the left-hand side. The the tulips haven't started blooming yet, but still, even without the bulbs, you still have that wonderful texture and color coming from things as simple as mustard or parsley on the right hand side. I'm always trying to find something new and different, you know, really, since since I get to decide what what plants are being planted in there. I want to try something new for me. So this is my laboratory. And I, I just get to play with things like bromeliads. I mean, I don't know bromeliads, but I'll try them. I'll grow them out in the garden and see what they do. So every year, hopefully, I'm doing something different. So and every season showing people new and different things because you know we work for smithsonian it's all about showing you new and different or something you've forgotten from when you were a child so it brings back memories so our whole goal is to inspire and engage you and you know show you something different but you know and 
And I have amazing friends in the industry, which will often say, hey, Janet, have you ever tried Masanga? And if I say no, suddenly I'm bequeathed this amazing plant, which I don't know, but I get to put it out in the garden and watch it grow. I mean, look at this Musanga. It is a tropical tree. It's coming from Africa. It is the coolest, coolest thing. No, it is not hardy for us. I have to dig that thing up and take it back to, to overwinter in our greenhouse. But, oh, look how cool. And it's something new, and I'm constantly learning. And recently, I was asked by a friend to give a talk on the changes that I have seen in my lifetime of gardening. And, you know, it really, it, it was a different talk for me because I had never really thought about the changes in the industry. I'd always talked about what I was been, been doing. So so it, it caused me to go in a deep dive of looking back and how, how things have changed. So that's what today's journey is going to be about. It's my personal perspective on how things have changed in the perennial plant industry. And I realized as a kid, you know, or all along, my whole pursuit has always been about knowledge, learning more about plants. Um, I've always been curious about plants and mesmerized. Even as a kid, you know, I grew up in Indiana and I had gardening parents, you know, being the youngest of six kids, we had a huge vegetable garden. So that was my first introduction to gardening. And then um, I was involved in 4-H and again, with my mom and dad's help, learning and growing new and different things. And I've always been a nerd. I, I've always, I've just loved seeing the plants and how they grow. Um, and back in the day, there there wasn't the internet. There, there weren't a whole lot of books on horticulture. There were vegetable gardening books, but not really about horticulture or ornamental gardening. So these were my Bibles, the Time Life Encyclopedia of Gardening. It's like, whoa, I devoured each and every one of those. Um, just, I, I absorbed everything I could. And then on Saturdays, when the Victory Garden would come on, James Underwood Crockett, I mean, the man seemed to know it all. And I, you know, you had to set your clock and be there to watch the show or maybe catch reruns. But, you know, that was always iffy. You had to be there to watch it because there was no uh, watch it again or tape it or anything. You had to be there. So the other way that I was was absorbing information was through catalogs. And in the day, the way you got on a catalog mailing list was send in these little flyers. Uh, and these were the larger companies that could afford to put these flyers in magazines and, and things like that. And you, you'd write away and they would send you a catalog. And most of the catalogs looked like this. You know, it was all about vegetable gardening and, and seed catalogs. It, it was about food and they'd have a few um, perennials in there, but really not much. It was it was vegetables and it was growing things from seed, um, you know, sugar snap peas, new 1979. <laughs> so, so cool. But the pictures that were in, in these um, catalogs were, you know, usually a little blurry and not not absolutely the best and if they did have flowers they would only show you a picture of the flower not the plant overall but the catalog i really looked forward to getting was wayside gardens wayside was like oh oh mama um the reason wayside was so good was because they talked about plants 
other than vegetables. It was all ornamental and it was all about beauty. And and they'd have these pictures that would show more the, the shape of the plant and give you more information. And um, it was just, oh, it was wonderful. And of course, I had to get two copies of the catalog because being the nerd that I am and being in 4-H, we had plant identification classes or uh, competitions. And so I would make flashcards of my plants and I'd have the picture, which I cut out of Wayside Gardens catalog on one side of my flashcard and on the other side was all the information. Thus, I needed two catalogs because, you know, reverse the sides of the page. And yeah, I mean, I I could identify those plants from that picture. But if you gave me the plant without the flower, I had no idea because I had never seen it before. So yeah, I'm a nerd. I've always been a nerd and I'm glad I am. But one other way I was learning was through Horticulture Magazine. And horticulture would come once a month and I would just devour these things. Um, Horticulture Magazine introduced me to, to people like Christopher Lloyd on the left-hand cover and Elsa Bacalar on the right. I mean, this magazine, that was 1987. And I still remember her name as Elsa Bacalar. I've never met her or anything like that, but I read the magazine so often. I just memorized it and showing her garden. It was just amazing. But it opened, the, the magazine opened my eyes to the possibility of plants and who else was doing gardening. Well, mainly the Brits. So I learned about Vita Sackville West and, and Marjorie Fish, who was basically a master gardener, who was writing about her making her own garden at East Lambrook Manor. And just her joy of exploring these plants and learning about the plants and being able to share with others. And then I also learned about William Robinson down at Gravetide Manor and how he was really pushing back as, against the aesthetic of formal gardens. And he was he wanted more wild and free, free flowy gardens. So even in the 1970s, people were pushing back and, and trying to have styles of garden. Uh, and one uh, uh, one other uh, group of people I learned about through Horticulture Magazine were the Blooms of Bressingham. Uh, Adrian, uh, Alan Bloom, this gentleman right in the center, uh, he and his family, I mean, look at those styles. I mean, this is the 70s, honeys. Uh, but Alan Bloom was a radical, not only for his long, beautiful silver hair and his silver earring, but he was doing things like island beds, meaning he was he was planting perennials just in like a bubble or or peanut in the middle of his lawn without a hedge backing it. I mean, this was serious pearl clutching change in England because a perennial border needed to have a hedge behind. And so, I mean, how, how silly when we think of it now that the garden was so defined, like, oh, it must be a straight row and it must have a hedge behind. And yeah, and Alan, Alan Bloom was like, no, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. So I love the rebels that will break tradition and do it their own way. Um, many years later, when I was working in England, I had the opportunity to actually speak with, with Alan. Um, and he, at the time he was running his, his beloved steam engine. You know, he, he had two loves in life. One was plants and one with, were his steam engines. But it was like meeting an idol that you so worship 
and I, I was stymied for words. I, I had no words. I couldn't even say hello. I just sort of like looked at him. Um, but uh, he, he really influenced my life quite a bit. So that back to other influences from Horticulture Magazine or other avenues that these, these magazines opened to me was in the back of the magazine, there were little little ads for the smaller nurseries that couldn't afford those, those uh, flyers that would drop out of the magazine when you'd pick it up. And these little ads would usually be maybe three to five lines. And it, it was just um, the name of a nursery and what they specialized in and the address of where you could write away to to get their catalog. And so, of course, I wrote to so many places to get their their catalog. It was sending a self-addressed stamped envelope often. Uh, and most of the catalogs I would receive might be a single page mimeographed, yes, mimeographed um, sheet of all these botanical names with all these little very, very short abbreviations because space was money. So they wanted to fit as much information on a page as possible. So they would have all these abbreviations for sun, shade, um, light levels, various things like that. Um, really short descriptions um, telling you how tall it got and and um, maybe the the color of the flower. But it was all written, um, no, no real visuals. And if they did have a visual, it would usually be an insert um, within the catalog, a, a couple of pages of a close up of a flower, various things, things like that. Uh, so you could see the color gold. But of course, printing in those days, color matching wasn't really the best. Um, so you know, that was one way to learn. But one of the catalogs I, I wrote away for was Holbrook Farm and Nursery. And this was a, a little nursery run by my now friend, Alan Bush. Um, and Alan, Alan cut the plant bug uh, right out of, co well, yes, he, he went to college, but he didn't major in horticulture. He majored in sociology. And so here he gets out with this sociology degree and then he caught the plant bug and somehow he finagled his way. So he had a year internship at Royal Botanic Garden Kew in England. And then he came back and ended up opening his own nursery and, and he wanted to be growing perennials. And in the day, there weren't that many perennials available and so if you were offering them for sale, you had to do all the propagation yourself, all the marketing, all the sales, all, I mean, the whole thing, you needed to do everything. And Alan, Alan ran this fabulous little mail order nursery that I had the opportunity to go visit once. Um, but I almost memorized his catalog because Alan told stories. He told stories about the plants and stories about how they were growing and what they were doing in his real garden. So you were learning from a fellow gardener. And I so remember one, one story Alan, um, Alan wrote about in, in his catalog um, that he had read in a British catalog about you know, and since Alan had never taken a horticulture class, Latin, Latin names of plants, he, he really didn't know. Um, and there was no place to look them up either. So Alan read this description of this plant that got like five to seven feet tall, sturdy, upright stems, bloomed late in the season, big trusses of lavendery pink flowers on the top that drew in all kinds of insects. And he's like, oh, very cool. So he jumped through all the hoops to import plants from England. 
got these little precious babies in, grew them on. And, and as, as they're growing, Alan starts realizing, hey, these look like those ditch weeds that right down the road, Joe Pie weeds. And sure enough, yes, Alan had imported Eupatorium, a native U.S. plant that was literally growing down the street from him in, in the wild areas. Um, he had imported it from England because it sounded so cool. And it was so cool. It's a fabulous plant. But um, most American native plants in the 1980s into the 90s were not accepted in our gardens. They were ditch weeds, they were wildflowers, they were, they were not pedigreed enough to be accepted into a garden. And that happened again and again and again. So many of our native plants, we did not accept into our gardens until someone else, preferably someone in England, had given them the seal of approval that these are really good plants to grow in a garden. So uh, that's just one story of Alan in, in that. Uh, but here's, here's another thing that was happening in the 1980s. Um, Dr. Stephen Still was, was teaching at The Ohio State University in Ohio, and um, he was teaching a, a herbaceous perennial class, and he realized there was a, a real need for knowledge of perennials outside of his classes. So um, Steve uh, held what he thought would be a one-time symposium to share information about the growing, selling, and using of perennial plants. Well, he expected like 50 people to show up and instead like 250 people showed up. So he saw the need for more information. So the Perennial Plant Association was formed the following year. And it is the only professional organization solely devoted to perennial plants. Um, this year, uh, it marks our 40th year of being in in uh as an association so and and we welcome everyone to join us as long as you're passionate about perennials um everyone is free to join so if you want to know more contact me about that but you know this this first meeting of the minds of, of perennials sharing perennials what would happen was everyone would gather in a very dark room and there would be the presenter using slides. So many of you might know slides, but any any younger person does not understand slides. Um, the presenter would have 60 slides in a carousel. Usually they the slides went in upside down and backwards was the, the right way to put in a slide. And you always knew how, how much the presenter had um, reviewed the slides because I, always that if someone had been rushed and put the slides in, there was always one that was upside down or a big old honking hair across the slide. <laughs> they were all blurry. And you would hear that click, 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 click for each slide as it would go forward. And always someone need to, needed to sit right beside the projector to um, do the focus for each individual slide because some of the slides were always a little out of focus and things like that. Um, and I got to know slides really well because um, I was sitting in classrooms at Purdue and this is how we were learning perennials also or all plants were through slides. Uh, and Kodak really thought that they had come up with some new thing by having a slide carousel that held 140 slides. Well, they it jammed every single time. So the whole program would have to stop and fix and pry that, that uh, jam slide out of the projector. It's like, ah, oh, it's so easy these days with, with digital. But 
anyway, the, what I was learning at Purdue and, and again, at Purdue in the 1980s, I, I was, I was a professional studying horticulture. We had a six week class that covered perennials and annuals in six weeks. That's like nothing. So, I mean, but they really weren't out there. So the basic definition that I remember from, from college of a good perennial was something with a long season of bloom. First and for, foremost. Second, no pests or no, no diseases. So no critters munching on the foliage or anything like that. Um, and something that required very little input of staking or deadheading or dividing. So really what was available were flax paniculatas, which are natives, but they had been cultivated for decades in Europe. So they were okay. Um, iris, bearded iris, not Siberian. Siberian was very exotic. Peonies, the herbaceous uh, peonies, and daylilies or hemorrhocalis. Hemero so those were those were widely available and widely sold because they were easy to ship and easy to divide. And that, that was what was basically available in the 80s. But as I'm studying perennials and, and um, as I'm studying horticulture at Purdue, I keep hearing these rumors and the rumblings of this, this um, team of landscape architects, Wolfgang Ome and Jim Van Sweden, making, making the papers and headlines because they were doing something radical with their landscapes and they were doing mass plantings of perennials and these things called ornamental grasses, which no one had ever heard of. But the basics, the basis of their landscapes wasn't hardscapes or woody plant material. It was things that died to the ground every year, herbaceous perennials. I mean, this was this was ground shaky and really changing. Um, and when I got out of Purdue, I was able to go and work for this gentleman, Kurt Blumel Incorporated. And I realized there was a relationship between Kurt, who was growing all these ornamental grasses and perennials, and Ome van Sweden, who was then using these plants that Kurt was producing. So they were a really good team that couldn't... Um, couldn't exist without the other. So Kurt would provide the plants and the diversity of plants and the volume of plants Wolfgang and Jim were looking for. And uh, Kurt, uh, Jim and Wolfgang were buying the plants to keep Blumel in business. So it, it was a really good experience. And a, um, I was still learning my plants. And I remember there's a big trade show every year in January at the Baltimore Convention Center. It's called MANTS, Mid-Atlantic Nurseryman Trade Show. And it is a big deal anymore. Um, there, I was just there. I think there were like 3,000 people came to the trade show during the two days it was open or two and a half days. And... Um, I can't remember how many vendors, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of vendors. So all these little booths of wholesale vendors selling, uh, showing you their wares for that, that upcoming year. But my first manse was in 1988 and there were still a lot of booths and things. However, there were less than 10 that were selling perennials that, you know, those weeds that die back, those, you know, and so we really were doing something different. We were cutting edge. We were, we were weird. We, perennial growers were weird, um, but, and I'm proud to be weird. So that was in 1988. Um, and then I, I had the opportunity to work in, in England, uh, Germany and England both. And um, in England, 
this woman, Beth Chatto, was teaching. Um, I was working in her nursery and she had a beautiful garden that that attached to the nursery and sales sales area. And she was teaching things, design aesthetics, like start planning a garden about the foliage. It's not about the flower and how long the flower blooms. Look at a plant for its really good foliage and to make a really beautiful naturalistic garden, you start with the foliage and start placing plants together, how their foliage and texture goes together, not how the colors, you know, colors are important and the flower is important, but really it's short lived. So something might only bloom for two weeks of the year, but the other 34, 40 weeks of the year during, during the growing season, it's all about the foliage. So texture first, that was, that was like, uh, she was ahead of her time on that. And her other big lesson Usually, um, if you read any of the books, it, the books always talked about amending your soil, making your soil as rich as possible and add organic materials and double dig your, your beds and all of this work before you'd even think about what plant was going in that, that space. But Beth was looking at it as an ecologist and looking at what plants are adapted to the soil I have, the soil that that is naturally present. So she was saying right plant for the right place. Pick a plant that is adapted to the soils and atmosphere that you have versus trying to change everything. I, it's so simplistic now, but at the time it was, oh, again, pearl clutching for the Brits. Um, and another influence that I had while, while working in, in England was Christopher Lloyd, who was a very good friend of Beth's. And they could not have been po more polar opposites. Uh, Beth, beautiful, demure, created naturalistic gardens that were just a thing of beauty and grace and elegance. And then Christo, bold and brash and colors that that defy and and just exuberance, exuberance. The man knew his plants inside out and backwards. I mean, he wrote a column for 42 years, a weekly column and never repeated about plants. 42 years, oh my goodness, amazing. But so I'm reading all these books on design and what a garden should be and, and what, what it should look like and the rules and the principles and all of these things, all these rules. And I see these two individuals, top of their game, top of their game with beautiful gardens that reflect their personalities and it was crystal clear a garden is not does not need to follow anyone else's rules it is your artistic expression it is your painting it is you it is it is whatever brings you happiness and yeah so forget about the rules forget about you know, all of that other stuff, follow your heart and follow your bliss. Um, and so that was a huge lesson for me to learn. So I come back to the U.S. after being in Europe for a couple of years, and I noticed technology has really started changing the way things are happening with, with nurseries. And I'm still working in the nursery industry and in production. And something like a fax machine, I mean, it sounds so simple, but a fax machine changed and really elongated the workday because orders could be received or placed whether, whether the recep uh, 
the recipient was open or not. So you didn't have to make that phone call only when the office was open. You could send a note, you could send a message, you could place an order while the, the business was closed. And then when we'd come in the next morning, we'd have those new orders and pull them for that day for someone to get. So technology really changed and elongated the workday. So what else was happening? Oh, finally, we had books. We had books being written by authors about American gardens. Uh, these two encyclopedias of herbaceous plants came out in 1989, um, one by the esteemed uh, professor, Dr. Armitage, Alan Armitage, who was teaching down at University of Georgia at the time, and the other Perennials for American Gardens by Ruth Clausen and Nikki Ekstrom. Um, what I find really, really funny about this um, is that Alan is originally from Canada and Ruth Clausen is an import for what, from Wales. Um, but they, they had lived in the U.S. long enough to know there was a dearth of information here available. Uh, what else also was starting, there were more books about American gardens. Alan Lacey started writing all these fabulous books that would teach you and tell you about all these gardens that were out there. So Americans start are starting to garden more and share what they're they're learning. Uh, and Ome Van Sweden is still making headlines with their bold romantic gardens and their mass, mass plantings of things, especially ornamental grasses, uh, miscanthus, and and all kinds of things that no one else had was using. And there were no books available or the internet to look plants up. So this was a class um, taught by Longwood Gardens, um, Rick Dark was teaching, and all of the different cultivars of Miscanthus sinensis that were available and, and the descriptors. Um, this, was, this was my reference book for quite a long time. Um, and in the back, there were resources of where you could get some of these wonderful things. But do you notice anything missing? This is in 1992. There's not even phone numbers and oh my goodness, there were no websites because the web had just been introduced and um, horticulture, agriculture people, we were not first adapters of, or adopters of technology. We rather play in the dirt and, and work outside than mess with computers as a general statement. Uh, but, other technology was entering our work field. Uh, not these little flimsy work phones like this, uh, these flip phones. These were way too fragile for those of us that were actually fingers in the dirt out in the field. We had these big old bricks um, it, it, of telephone that did look and have the heft of a brick that were bright yellow. And one of my colleagues at, at Smithsonian, um, Michael, who is a, a druid when it comes to technology, um, he, uh, he had one of these up until five years ago when it finally was peeled from his, uh, his hands. But technology is starting to bring us together more and, and uh, we can now interact more. And the World Wide Web, www. was started in 1991. Uh, but Google, a search engine, how to find things on the web wasn't introduced until 1996. And some of you might remember Ask Jeeves and some of these other, other places, but um, 1996. Uh, but what was happening in the industry? There were there were a lot of changes um, that were just quietly happening. 
um, Buzz Babico started a um, propagation nursery called Greenleaf Enterprises, where they would do the propagation um, mainly of annuals and ship to growers so that the growers could just plug things out. They didn't have to have a propagator on staff. They didn't have to start things from seed. Here were baby plants that were sent to you and you could just grow them on. Um, and in the early 80s, he saw the need for more and more perennials and started doing propagation of perennials and shipping out. So little nurseries like Allen Bush and Holbrook Farm didn't have to have you know, start from the seed or the cutting, they could buy in these little plants and just grow them on. So the perennial liner industry is huge now. Most nurseries, uh, and I say uh, most that are growing more common perennials are buying in the plugs and then just growing them on. And that's thanks to Buzz Babico starting that. Other, other changes in the industry that I, I witnessed and I started seeing was the creation of this nursery called Terra Nova. And if you look at the logo up here, even in the logo, you see a test tube. So they were breaking ground, new ground of growing plants by micro propagation. And for anyone that doesn't know, that is like taking a little tiny growing tip out of a single plant, growing it on in a Petri dish or a test tube, growing it on on auger and creating new plants by the millions from one mother plant. So it sped up how quickly a new plant could come onto the market because of use of technology. So Terra Nova Nurseries, founded by Dan Himes and his now wife, Lynn Barn Barnstein and Ken Brown, uh, Lynn and Ken were both microbiologists. And so they knew the tissue culture end and Dan knew passionate plantsmen. So you put them all together and then with Jody running the office, you've got a dream team. So still very much in business now. Um, and Terra Nova, because they were more uh, technology focused, they were the first to put a CD in their catalog so that not only were they, you know, I, I no longer had to cut up catalogs to make, uh, make my my notes or anything they were giving me all the information I needed but it was also all the information anyone needed to market those plants which were only available through Terra Nova so that that was a huge advance in plants and then in 1992 a company called Proven Winter Winners it's a marketing firm they really don't grow plants they are marketing. So it was the first time there was a company devoted solely to getting the word out about certain plants and 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 really marketing the plants. Other all other places like clothing lines had all had marketing done for them, but plants and marketing this was a, a whole new thing. And they are still going gangbusters and teaching people how to grow really good plants. So that was 1992. Um, but as all of this is happening and all these new plants are coming to the market and new and different and, and um, exotic, there's a drumbeat going on in the background of potentially these plants that we're bringing in, there might be a problem. There might be a problem. And um, pretty soon it was very obvious and you could not not see that, th that those things that we passionate gardeners had been like lusting for and bringing in and just ogling over the beauty they were having more impact on the environment and 
um, that there were at, the actions of the gardeners were impacting environment. And yeah, it's, um, and I, I am sad to say that I was one of those that was helping propagate miscanthus, the plant in the top left-hand corner by the thousands. Um, they were bred in Northern Germany by Dr. Ernst Poggles and they were sterile in Northern Germany. So we, there was no real thought about, well, you know, the climatic difference between Northern Germany and Maryland, um, a long growing season with much warmer, warmer summers. I, we didn't think we we were just so rambunctious to get these really cool plants in our gardens we we did not we were not aware of the environmental consequences um but other people were other people were banging on the drum well before it became really obvious to the rest of us and one of them was my friend neil de bull uh, Neil is trained as an ecologist and environmentalist, and he graduated in 1970. And by 1980, 82, he was working with a nursery called Prairie Nursery, which he now owns and operates, and really calling out, you know, we need to be planting our native plants, not bringing in um, grasses from somewhere else. We have really cool native grasses that were not being uh, used. Uh, Neil was well ahead of her, his time, along with many other people, um, and including my friends at North Creek Nursery. Um, this this wholesale nursery was started in Delaware, um, and even their tagline where horticulture meets ecology. That was groundbreaking because really it had all been, those were two separate planets. Ecologists were on one, one planet and horticulturists were on the other. And rarely did the two planets come together. But North Creek saw the need for growing our natives and um, so that was 1988, um, and they're still going strong and producing native plants to go out with us. Um, and that's that's the other thing that that started happening. Well, first of all, when when did they become native plants instead of roadside weeds or wildflowers? Suddenly, we're aware of the need and the necessity for to have insects in our garden and the butterflies. And much of that to me comes down to uh, the monarch butterfly as the, the poster child of we've got to save the monarch. You know, every kid knows and remembers stories of growing up and having monarchs flitting through your garden. I mean, it's so iconic and we're losing them. So native plant sales are popping up everywhere. And much, uh, I give this man, Doug Talame, um, so much credit for really bringing to light the challenges our environment is facing and, and the, the challenges for the insects. Uh, if you haven't read his books, Doug Talame is amazing. He's an entomologist. And he started noticing the decline of insects in his private garden in Delaware. And so he started writing these books about how our gardens can be, be a place for insects too. So Bringing Nature Home was his first book. And then Nature's Best Hope and then The Nature of of Oaks, um, his most recent book. They are groundbreaking books that really highlight the need and the just urgency for all of us to be planting native plants whenever possible. Doug is not a purist. 
Doug is not telling you that you have to have natives only in your garden. He will be the first to say, if you love peonies and you want some peonies in your garden, go for it. But please plant some natives along with your peonies. So balance, uh, a balanced ecology, uh, but planting natives whenever possible. And, and, you know, our insects need them. So Doug really redefined what a garden is. No longer is a garden just about us and bringing joy and, and beauty to the humans that are making the gardens. A garden can be and should be home and habitat for natural creatures, be they four-legged, two-legged, or 18 legs. I, you know, invite in nature to your garden and um, it'll be even more rewarding. So another person that, that really had an impact on the way we start viewing gardens was this man, Pete Odoff. And Pete's, Pete's a, a Danish landscape architect and plantsman. And Pete starts really redefining for us what is beautiful. You know, what, what, what is beauty? What and what is a garden? Does a garden have to be like like a linear border with, with plants stacked on top of each other? Or is a garden more like a meadow that you can walk through and enjoy the swaying breeze and the, the plants moving and dancing about you? And, and Pete also started questioning beauty in death. I mean, a, a plant in decline is has its own certain beauty, just like humans. Um, with age comes wisdom and beauty and and just so much if you stop and look and stop defining beauty only as a 17-year-old runway model walking down the catwalk. There is beauty in all stages of life. And Pete really brought that to the forefront and made us start questioning what is beautiful and what is a garden? So with Pete, you know, how we garden started changing between, between Doug Talamay's lesson about that the insects are living in your garden and leaving the stems up for the winter for the insects. And also Pete saying, leave things up because the beauty, there's beauty in decay. So between these two men, you know, they've changed how we define a garden, what we define as beautiful, and also how we garden. We're no longer cleaning up a garden in the fall and putting it to bed. We are leaving things up and waiting until spring when, when the insects are emerging out of those overwintering stems. So leaving things up. And if you can't leave them up, until it's over 50 degrees and everything, cut them back gently. And I leave piles everywhere so that the insects, if they're still in those stems, they haven't been crushed and, and mangled. They can still emerge later. So big changes. And another big, big change. This is part of Pete Odoff's work. Um, this is the High Line in New York City. Um, the High Line, for those of you that have never been, um, it was the old railroad tracks. It was an elevated railroad track that brought trains in for the meatpacking district. So um, uh, they they came into the slaughterhouses full of livestock. Um, and these lay, had lain derelict for a long time, and they were ready to be torn apart until a group of people had gone up and they saw this inherent beauty up there in the wildness of what was growing up on those railroad tracks. And so they formed an organization, Friends of the High Line. They totally revitalized the entire thing, 
redid it, replanted it, but they put the railroad tracks back in so that you knew, you know, that you knew the history of the place. This now is one of the most visited places in New York City. It's only between uh, 30 and 50 feet wide at the most and goes for about a mile and a half, maybe two miles. And it is free. It is open to the public at all times. And people flock to the High Line. And all of those buildings around the High Line, which once were not not in the best neighborhoods, well, people have seen peop that that people are coming to this. They want to be around the plants. So all of the economy in that area has really flourished. And all those buildings are now high rent district. So plants are an economic driver, especially in a city where people want to be around plants. Plants will bring you money and every city planner now realizes that and they're trying to incorporate more green spaces and more plants in, in city spaces to mitigate the water, to mitigate various problems, um, putting green roofs on to lower temperatures, all kinds of things that plants will do. Um, and you know, th this whole phrase biophilia, it was uh, phrased by E.O. Wilson, first used the phrase, the innate pleasure from living abundance and diversity as manifested by the human impulse to imitate nature with gardens. We want to be about, around plants. We need to be about, around plants. That's why when you go for a walk in the woods, suddenly you're calmer. Things are, you know, you feel better. Your mood is lift, lifted. And that couldn't have been shown more uh, during COVID. Biophilia, the whole idea we're locked in spaces. We can't go out. We, we're not allowed to do various things, but people still wanted to be around plants. That The house market craze just blew. I mean, we're back in the 1970s again, which is fabulous. Um, house plants are the thing. People want to be around plants. They want to nurture. So... How, we, where does that bring us to date? I mean, now we are surrounded with so much information. In my hand, in this little thing, I have more information than I have ever had access to. There's websites, there's vlogs, there's YouTube and Facebook and, and all of this information, this plant information that's out there on the internet. I mean, you might even see me giving advice. I mean, it's all out there. But is it all correct for your garden? Um, that's that's where we've got to stop. Um, the information is out there, but not all the information is right for you. Uh, when I was a young gardener, I thought there were three things you need to needed to know to grow a plant. You needed to know the hardiness zone, USDA hardiness zone. You needed to know light requirements, sun, shade, moist, you know, things like that. And moisture requirement, moist soil, dry soil. What is it tolerant of? But the more I learned, I started realizing these are just guidelines. These are not the formula to of perfection. A hardiness zone just will tell you the coldest temperature that that plant will grow in, an average cold temperature. Doesn't talk about if the temperature will drop 40 degrees in one day, like it did last year uh, when, when we were in the 60s and it dropped to the 20s. Uh, light requirements. Well, full sun in South Carolina is not equitable to full sun in Vermont. Vermont is a much milder sun versus hot blazing sun in South Carolina. Uh, moisture. <laughs> Moist 
moist, well-drained soil. That always gets me. <laughs> I mean, that is, uh, is that during the winter? Is that during the summer? When, when is that? So again, these are just guidelines, not hard, fast rules. Um, here's, here's a quote for you. The, the growing of plants is a complex site-specific science where all facts in all, are not true in all situations. And I'm going to back that up by this fact. Ficus benjamania is a tree. Ficus benjamania, for those of you that that might not recognize it, is the fig tree that you grow often as a houseplant in, in this area. Well, you put that out outside in our climate in the DC metro region or wherever you're gardening, if it's not in a fully tropical location, it'd be dead. It'd be dead over the winter because it cannot handle cold temperatures. So it is a tree in, in some parts of the world. In other parts of the world, it's either a house plant or if you plant it outside, it'll be dead over the winter. So it'd be an annual. So uh, I think there's a whole big difference between information and knowledge. And information is just everywhere. But is it true for your specific site? That's that's where the knowledge comes in. Um, and my husband's an engineer. And when we first got together, he I was trying to teach him about gardening. And, um, you know, being an engineer, he's looking for A plus B equals C or some derivative thereof and some some type of formula that he could use and make it exact. But gardening is so much more complex than that. You know, for example, steel, like an I-beam, has the same tensile strength, the same, that same piece of steel anywhere in the world will have the same properties. You take the same plant, and it might not even, like our example of the ficus, it might not even be in the same classification, annual, perennial, or, or compost. So perennials and gardening is such a complex science. Um, so really, it's, it's the input of information, the basic facts, and then observation your observation and knowledge of your growing area, and then your years of experience of trying to grow things in your area. You put those all together and it needs all three circles of, of information or all three perspectives. And only then you get down to that little purple center and that's knowledge. Knowledge is what we're all seeking. It's not information. Information is just one piece of the puzzle. We need all three to be able to grow plants successfully. And things change. Uh, horticulture is an evolving science that is regional and site specific. I mean, we're now talking about plant communities and and the interaction of plants with soil and mycorrhiza and and all of these things that that back in the 1980s we weren't talking about those things we we didn't know so science keeps changing and we're learning more about how dynamic and how just complex plants are and amazingly complex. So wrapping wrapping up, you know, to answer the that question that I was posed of what has changed in the perennial industry, it's like, wow, what hasn't changed? Um, first of all, plants and gardens are no longer just about beauty. It's no longer about just pleasure for the gardener. It's it's more about 
providing habitat and homes for so much more things. And we've realized gardens are financially important and we need gardens around us to as human beings we we need green around us and we need gardeners we need knowledgeable gardeners that are i mean they are poised to help mitigate all the environmental challenges that we're we're facing but it's not just having the information, it's the knowledge that we need. And we need knowledgeable gardeners also to, to call out things that you'll see on the internet that are blatantly false. Um, I I saw a, a, a little clip on Instagram the other day of someone taking a hybrid tea rose and pulling the petals off and dipping the petals in honey and then cinnamon and then putting them in a rooting rooting tray and covering it up and growing a new rose bush from the petals of a rose. We need to call that stuff out. That is, any beginning gardener will try that and they're going to fail because it's impossible. It is just a total lie. But but a beginning gardener will think they messed up. They were the problem, not the information that was given them. So knowledgeable gardeners, we need to speak up and call out BS when we see it. So, but the on the flip side of what has changed in the industry and what has not changed in the gardening industry are the people the people of horticulture, the people of the dirt, the people that, you know, with dirty fingernails or bad fingernails and, you know, muddy clothes and muddy, muddy knees. The people are the kindest, the most supportive, the most helpful and thoughtful and, and generous people on earth. And we want everyone to be a successful gardener and a happy gardener. So, you know, but you're not going to learn everything alone. So you learn by sharing your experiences with others. So I highly recommend everyone get connected with, with your tribe, find your people, share your knowledge and learn from others. Um, garden clubs, attending lectures like this one today and, and conferences and professional organizations or just walking through a garden and seeing someone garden. Talk to them, ask them questions. You're, you're always going to learn. And the more we learn, the better we are. So if you're ever walking around and you come through the Ripley Garden, here between the Arts and Industries building and the Hershore Museum on the National Mall, and you see someone digging in the dirt and covered with filth, most likely me or one of my fabulous volunteers, um, please stop, say hi, and uh, maybe we'll, we'll share some information. So until then, happy gardening, be well. Janet, thank you. Thank you so very much. It's just terrific. Um, I'll send you the chat box so you can see how much people enjoyed it. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, Janet knows I asked her to be a speaker today because, well, we've worked for years together and Janet's always been so helpful to my career and hopefully I've helped her out in different ways uh, too because I've really enjoyed uh, what we've learned working together. And I'm saying this because and I'm going to choke up. Oh, so tear up, honey. I am retiring. Um, I am leaving. This is going to be my last Let's Talk. But you'll still have Janet and Alex and all the other wonderful, wonderful speakers that we have brought on Let's Talk. And Let's Talk is going to continue. And I would like to introduce you to Katie Munn. Katie, come on. Katie is Smithsonian Gardens' new education specialist. Say hi, Katie. Hi, everyone. I am thrilled that Katie is going to be on board and she's going to continue with Let's Talk Gardens. 
Now, I'm just going to retire from Smithsonian Gardens. I'm not retiring from horticulture. Janet knows it's in our blood. We're never going to stop playing with plants. We're never going to stop hugging trees. And that's what I'm going to go do. I, I, I enjoy bringing this information to you all, but it's time for me to hug trees, just like Janet gets to do. That's what we started out doing. I need to get back out there. Um, so thank you all for joining us. I'm sorry we went over a bit, but thank you for all your comments and look forward. We do have one more Let's Talk African American Gardens, and it's all going to be about houseplants and how important they are. So join us for March 7th for that. But in the meantime, Janet, keep doing a fabulous job and bringing information like this to everyone. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very, very fortunate. And thanks for uh, helping me out all these years. Well, I, you don't need any help. Keep going, honey. <laughs> Talk to you later. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks for all the love.